pick up where we left off last Sunday, combine a little bit of what we talked about Wednesday night. Um, last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday, and we talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to continue that today. Um, 19. I'm going to start at verse 1. I want to talk about baptism as a separate event than conversion. Um, from, con, I'm sorry? What did you say? No, baptism, from... baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, so, baptism of the Holy Spirit separate from conversion, from being born again. Um, I want to talk about those two things. And I want to talk about that. We talked a little bit about that last week. Um, I want to just continue in that. It, th the reason, I think, is number, number one, it's Pentecost season, right? It's, the, it's last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday. And, but also, I believe this is one of the most neglected teachings in the church today. Um. So I want us to just talk about it. Let's explore. I got some scripture. I think it's going to help us. And then I want to contrast. I, I, I've been trying to define in my mind the last couple of weeks, what, how can I define what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is and does in our lives? But I think better than that, I want to contrast. I want to contrast my life before and after. And I want to contrast John Wesley's life before and after. Of course, John Wesley is who the, the founder of Methodism. And I want to contrast his life before and after. We did a little bit of that Wednesday night, but uh, I think it's important. Um, Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, and you're all probably going to remember this scripture, he said, um, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So my question with that scripture is if, is, if the baptism of the Holy Spirit is synonymous with conversion, then why do you have to ask? Right? So I want to I combat that a little bit because we get a little teaching that, well, you get all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get when you get born again. So I want to try to knock some religion down a little bit and just kind of plainly go to Scripture, right? Acts chapter 19, verse 1, let's start there. Um, it says, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? Well, let's stop there for a minute. What is Paul not doing? Paul is not questioning their salvation. In fact, he called them believers. That means they're born again. Okay? He, or did, did you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit when you became believers? That tells me there's two different things here. There's two different things going on. Did you receive it when you became believers? That's probably a great question we should ask ourselves today. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became a believer? I mean, that's a great question. <laughs> you know, we should ask ourselves that today. Um, let's, let's, let's go. They replied, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul is, is, is fighting some wrong teaching in a very new movement. The movement of Christianity is in its infancy here. And I also want to point out that we, during this time, were not called Christians. That was not our name. That's a relatively new term. Do you know what we were called in this day? Followers of the way. That's what we were called. I like that a little better because it implies that there's cooperation and movement on my part. Not just simply filling out a card, filling out a seat 
on Sunday morning and boom, I'm a Christian. Well, I tithed last month. That must mean I'm a Christian. No, this implies a following. I follow. Remember, Christianity was never developed to be a religion. It was developed to be a relationship with a living God whom we were cut off from when Adam made of the tree. But through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the veil in the temple was torn. Now we have access back to the Father. Nevermore will the presence of God be confined to a building. Now He lives in us. Right? So that's the religion that I want to combat is that He lives in us. Right? Christianity was supposed to be a relationship, not simply a statement of doctrine. It was supposed to be a way to live and a way to, to express what happened to us on the inside. It's a way for us to express it on the outside. You get, you get the general idea of what I'm talking about? So just like baptism, water baptism, which is an, inward, an outward sign of an inward grace, what is that inward grace? That we got born again. Our spirit became alive. Right? We got born again. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is another sign of another type of grace that we receive. Right? So Paul, we find Paul asking these believers, well, did you get baptized in the Holy Spirit when you, first, when you became believers? They said, we don't even know that there is a Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? And Paul says, well, into them what were you baptized? And they answered into John's baptism. This is John the Baptist, right? The forerunner of Christ. The one who came to proclaim the way. Remember the followers of the way. John was proclaiming the way, right? He said, those who come after me. That, that he who comes after me, right? All right. Paul said, this is verse 4. John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Period. That's water baptism. Very important. Very, very important. Now, period. Verse 6. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. Okay? So here we go. They received water baptism. Then Paul laid his hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. I don't believe a man or a woman has to lay hands on you to receive the Holy Spirit. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit when no one else was around. Just me and God. Okay? Okay? But in this case, Paul did. Now this tells me this tells me that um, we have to there, there's, there's two different things going on. All right? You have a conversion where you're born again. Then you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit which does something else. Now I want to contrast in a few minutes. Um, what that baptism does. Here's a problem, though. When we read this, we get worked up about these gifts. That's where the big division comes from. We get divided on the gift of tongues, gifts of prophecy. Don't forget, there's also the gift of faith. There's the gift of healing. There's, there's several gifts but instead of focusing on the gifts, I want to I focus on the one who gives the gifts. Now, to be clear, I believe these gifts are active. I believe they are for today. Okay, I don't believe, they, I don't believe in cessationism. That's the proper term for it. I believe they're active for today. All right? But how out of order would it be if I went to God and said, give me more of you so that I can operate in your gifts. In other words, what if the motivation of my heart was to manipulate him into doing something so I could get something nice and shiny to make people look at me? 
Unfortunately, in some charismatic circles, that's what it's been dissolved down into. It's all about functioning in the gifts and not about flowing in the one who gives the gifts. Okay? When we do that, we reduce God down to a cosmic vending machine. You, you put your dollar bill in and you get the prize out and you get to use the prize. Right? That, that's not God. Remember, this is relational. I'm able to flow in gifts because I know the gift giver. And the abuse comes because the recalling of the Lord is without repentance. So we get, without change in other words, so we get people who have moved, across, moved away from, from where they're supposed to be and they're flowing in gifts outside of relationship and abuse comes. See, everything I do, I want it to be done from relationship. I can't use what he's given me the way he wants me to use them if I don't know his ways. I can't know his ways without knowing him. One of the most awesome things in Scripture that I found really early on that just rocked my world was that Jesus said, I no longer call you friend, a servant, I call you friends because servants don't know what their master's doing. That tells me that I'm able to have a relationship with a God who created everything and not only just have a relationship and be a servant where I serve, but I'm also his friend and that now I know his ways. That's amazing to me that, I, that, that the God of the universe cares enough about me to let me know his ways. Not just to do what he tells me like a hard taskmaster, although he's worthy of that. He says, do, I do. He's worthy of that, but he wants me to also know his ways. Now, here's a big, here, here's what that does for us. We're encountered with a situation, a circumstance, a trial, or whatever it may be. It may not even have to be anything bad. It may be something good. And now, because I know him and I've been transformed or am becoming transformed, now I respond not out of a sense of duty or, well, let me see what the scripture says. Well, he says I have to do this, so let me do it this way. Now my nature's changed in such a way where I respond just like he would respond, and it's second nature. Now, to be sure, that's not true in every area of my life <laughs> yet. All right? And whoever put the third window uh, of Mac in McDonald's drive through on Facebook, that was not fair. That was below the belt. Uh, you know I struggle in drive throughs uh, Who did that? I think it was Gail. What? It was Gail. Uh, not, and she didn't show up today, you know, coward. She knew I was going to call her out on that. So, of course, it's not that way in every area of my life, but he wants it to be. Okay? He wants me to be familiar with his ways. How does that change our prayer life? How does that change our prayer life? Does our prayer life look like I sit down, and I begin to pray, and I say, God, I need you to do this. God, I need this. This I need you to do over here. This part, I, I just need you to work over here, and, and I need you to do it this way. In Jesus' name, amen. So, and, and, and I hope I get it right. right? So, my prayer life, let me put it this way. If, this is going to hurt, so brace yourself. If your prayer life consists of you giving a to-do list to God, you don't have a prayer life. Amen. Have you ever felt that your, that your prayers may hit the ceiling and just bounce right back down and they never get through? Have you, have you examined what you're saying? How much time did you spend in praise? How much time did you spend worshiping? How much time did you spend in silence? Listening. 
a lot of the times I have found, especially in relationships where I'm asking the Lord to move in a relationship, most of the times it is not about him doing something, but he's trying to tell me if you want your relationship with this person restored, you need to go do this. I, most of the times, in other words, I'm not waiting on him, he's waiting on me. That's very true in relationships. If we're praying for relationships with other people to be restored, here's a pro tip. Spend time in silence meditating and thanking him over this relationship because more times than not, he's trying to get you to instruct, he's trying to instruct you, right, to do something because most of the time it's, he's waiting on you to begin with. Um, for instance, there's another way, um, finances. How many of us have ever prayed for increased finances? Sure. Well, I have two. You know what the Lord told me? Quit blowing money. <laughs> yeah. How can I... So here's the spiritual way to say that. How can I trust you with more if you're not stewarding what you have now correctly? So in other words, he could give me all the money in the world, but if I don't learn the basics of stewardship, I'll just be in the same place I'd be in... I'm in now but with just more junk. So in other words, now we get the revelation that more money might not be what the solution is. But learning to steward what I have correctly might be the solution. And then he can trust me with more. That's the difference between being a slave and being familiar with his ways. This is why Christy and I believe so strongly in this Dave Ramsey course that we te try to teach every year, every two years, because it teaches us biblical truths on how to steward what we have now. So some people just get it automatically, and if you're one of those folks, I don't like you. <laughs> I'm not one of those. <laughs> I'm not one of those, okay? But I have to, I've had to learn to be good stewards of what he's trusted me with now. Um, this is the difference between being a slave and merely doing what he tells me without no picture of the end and being familiar with his ways, knowing what the end's going to be. He's told us what the end's going to be. If you want to know what your calling is, it's to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Because freely you've received, now you go freely give. Well, I don't know if he wants me to be a teacher or a doctor. Pick one. But heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Because freely you've received, now go freely give. Well, I don't know if I should get married or if I should stay single. Pick one. <laughs> then go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Because freely you've received, now freely give. A slave always wants signs. A friend is familiar enough with his ways to move forward into nothingness. Do you get that? Slave always sends out a fleece first. Someone who's familiar with his ways can step into the darkness unafraid. I want to be familiar with his ways so I never have to put a fleece out, so I never have to ask for signs. I boldly step into the darkness and let my light shine. Now, I can't do that without the Holy Spirit. I can't do that without the Holy Spirit. So the word baptism, some of you have heard this. Um, it's a church word. Anywhere in America and most anywhere in the world, if I use the word baptism, we automatically think of water immersion, water sprinkling, water pouring, whatever the case, whatever your inclination is, we think of that act of baptism. However, in Jesus' day, this was not so. Baptism was a secular word. It was the Greek word baptizo. And it, was, and it had to do with the dying of cloth taking cotton, which is white, 
And let's say I want it red. Well, I get red dye and I put it in water and I boil it and I immerse the cloth in the dye until the cloth takes on the color of the dye. That was called baptizing. You would keep that cloth in the dye until the dye permeated all the way through the cloth. And then you'd pull it out. So when I say baptized in the Holy Spirit, let me put it in another way. Maybe some 21st century language. Have you, when you believe, did you allow the Holy Spirit to have every, all access to every area of your heart, your mind, your life? Did you surrender at all to Him? That would be baptizo language. Did you allow the Holy Spirit to permeate your very being all over? Because what's the minimum standard of salvation? Believe on the Lord Jesus in your heart, confess Him with your mouth that He is the Christ. You know, all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. You, 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 how many of you know that I can be a Christian, be born again, but not a disciple? A disciple is what? Someone who follows their rabbi. Jesus is our teacher. He's our modeler. He modeled life for us and we follow him. Right? Remember that sermon about discipleship? And if you wasn't here, go find it on YouTube. It's really, really good. Um, it's a good teaching. I, can be, I might be born again, but I might not be a disciple. And especially in our church in America today, we have a lot of preachers that merely sell fire insurance. Here, fill out this card, change the way you talk, change the way you dress, quit drinking this, stop eating that, give me 10% of your income, boom, you're in. Now you don't have to worry anymore. But we never really get to the point where we're really assured that we're saved. We always struggle with that, right? So that's not the gospel. <laughs> I'm sorry, the gospel means come and die. I've used this illustration in the past, but when Jesus called me, it was as if he put a sword on my chest like this, and then he said, come here. Well, if I come here, I'm going to run that through. I'm going to die. That's right. Come here. I need you to die. I need you to die to yourself so that you can receive freedom. Um, baptism of the Holy Spirit is a separate event than conversion. Conversion is important. Oh my gosh, it's, it's the best. <laughs> okay, I'm not down in that. But just because I'm converted, just because I'm born again, doesn't mean I'm following him. If I, if, if, if I want real freedom, if I really want to be able to, to truthfully say, you can't touch me, you can't hurt me, no matter what you say, no matter what you think, no matter what happens to me, including death, then I have to be able to be free of any attachment. My only attachment is him. Well, Jeff, what are you about your kid? What about your wife? Oh, I love them, but they're not mine. He gave them to me. I'm just sent to steward my child, but he belongs to God, not me. It's a fundamental shift in the way the world teaches us. But we've been tutored by the world system, and now... When Christianity comes, when Scripture comes and is in conflict with the way the world teaches us, it's a crazy battlefield going on in our mind. But we have to decide which one are we going to choose. Are we going to continue the way mom and dad told us to go? 
I'm not talking about anybody's specific mother and father, but I have to be careful with that because my mom and dad goes here. Um, <laughs> it's not what I'm talking about. But, but, but are, are we going to go with the way the world has taught us to do that makes sense? You know, it, it, it's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. Or are we going to really put all our eggs in that one basket called Jesus and live life the way he told us to live? It's freeing. It's like, here's the kingdom of God. Everything around that is the world. There's more freedom in the kingdom than there is in all that space outside of it. I don't know how that works, but there's more freedom in there than out. The more I let go, the freer I become. The more like him I'm transformed, the more freedom I experience. And I can't do that without the Holy Spirit. Um. Let's look at John Wesley for a minute. We, 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 we've covered, okay, we, we, we've covered some ground that says the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a surrendering of sorts. That I allow access to every part of my life. It, it's me saying, I want you. Now there's gifts that come with that, and I've not talked a lot about the gifts, and I'm purposefully not doing that today. We'll get to that. Okay, but that's outside of the scope. I, I, won't, I don't want to point you toward gifts. I want, you, I want to point you toward him. Then we'll learn to steward the gifts. Okay, does that make sense? There's a time for that. We'll get there, okay? I just want to point you to him because <laughs> he's awesome, right? He's wonderful. Um, and if you have him, he'll kind of teach you how to steward the gifts. All right, so anyway, Wesley the founder of Methodism, right? He was an Anglican priest. In other words, he was Episcopal, Church of England, right? His his mother, Susanna, raised him and their, their siblings as Christians. He was always a Christian, okay? He always was. He was always around it. His father was a priest. He's a bit of a heretical priest, but he was a priest nonetheless, um, Wesley went through confirmation, went, made a profession of faith at a young age, and Wesley in his adult life would write commentaries, would write treaties, would write sermons, would write all these dissertations about different aspects of Scripture, different theological debates that were going on at the time, and he would write these things, and they would be fantastic, just he was a very smart man. And then someone would say something to him or criticize what he wrote. And the next day he would be like, I'm not even a Christian. I'm, this serving God is impossible. I can't do it. No one can. I think it's out of grasp of everyone. And then the next day he'd wake up and he'd be right back on top of the mountain again. I'm a super Christian. <laughs> then a month later, something would happen again. And he'd be ready to throw in the towel. I just can't do this. I don't even think I'm saved. Then he goes to America to be a missionary. America is not quite an independent nation yet, but we're moving toward that way. So this is pre-1776. He, would, he went to America, went to Georgia, which was mainly a debtor's prison state. If you didn't know that, Georgia was, came from debtor's prison from England. In other words, in Europe, if you owed money, they would put you in prison. Well, people that owed a lot of money and that were just never going to pay it back, they shipped them off to Georgia and said, here, live or die, or whatever. <laughs> Explains a lot about Bulldog fans. Um, I, you know, go Tigers. Anyway, um, you got to excuse me, my... my I didn't have a voice last night at all, and I'm, str I'm on the struggle bus today with my voice, but I'm making it through it. Um, Wesley came to Georgia to be a missionary, to start his holy club, which is the way the Methodist church started, by the way. It was just a holy club. It's what they called them. Methodist were actually a derogatory term. It was an insult, um, <clears throat> but we just embraced it. He failed miserably. Total failure. Even had an illicit affair with a married woman. Total failure. 
on his way back to England on the ship. You know, it's not like hopping a plane. You got 11 hours to think. He probably took weeks to get there, right? He was in total humiliation. He was completely desperate. He wasn't a Christian anymore, he said. God had forsaken him, had abandoned him. His life would never amount to anything. So one day, a group of friends, he gets back to England, a group of friends say, hey, a group of friends that he met on the ship, by the way. And the ship went through a really bad storm. Here, here, here's how this worked out. This group of people, the, the ship went through a really bad storm, and Wesley thought they were going to die. They were going to sink and die. It was in the Atlantic. These people never lost a smile on their face. They were just bouncing around, praising God, singing hymns. All's well. It doesn't matter. It's all the things cool. And Wes is like, these people are dumb. They're crazy. You should read his journal entries during this time. He, these people are crazy. But then he later says, obviously these people have something that I don't. Here's what we take from that. The trial that you're going through today may be the demonstration of the gospel to someone who's watching you. And the way you handle that may mean life or death for eternity to someone else that you may not even see. It's important because this is a life or death stuff we're in, guys. This isn't just let's hope we get it and oh well. No, this is life and death stuff. This, what we're talking about, what you're, the stuff you're going through has eternal implications for others. Let that sink in for a minute. It's not funny games. It's as important. So he gets back to England, this same group of folks say, hey, come to a meeting with us. I don't want to. You don't understand. My life's in shambles. No, oh, come on. So he goes, him and some other folks from this holy club back in, back in Oxford, they come. Happened to be at a place called Aldersgate. Wesley writes, I'm in this service and this preacher is preaching this loud message about the Holy Spirit. And he said, and then I felt my heart strangely warmed and then all of a sudden the next thing I knew, everyone's laying on the floor as if they're dead. <laughs> Including Wesley. <laughs> they're all slain in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves and pow, everybody's just... Pow. Under the power of God. Wesley woke up and do you know what happened? He never questioned his salvation again. Not one time. Not one time. Why? Because in that moment of surrender, in that brokenness, and when it all looked lost, he said, God, here I am. I don't know what to do. That's a perfect place to be. He re received the Holy Spirit and he never questioned his salvation again. And his whole theology changed. In my own experience, I can echo some of those same words. Humiliated. A pariah of society. My life's over. I don't know what to do. I have nowhere else to go. That's a good place to be. I don't want to go back there again. <laughs> but praise God, I don't have to. Because I never have to be in a place where I don't have anywhere to turn. Because he's with me all the time. And he's the place I turn. I know this guy, he, he belongs to this little group that I used to go to and, and still have contact with him. We were talking one day about salvation. And this, this man makes a comment and says, man, I just, and this guy loves God, studies the Bible. I mean, he, he, he knows the word, but he just says, you know, I just, I just hope I make it. I, I just, I just hope when I die that I just hope that I get there by the skin of my teeth. And he had really no concept of who the Holy Spirit was. And he began to learn, and we began to talk, and he began to study and 
pray and God began to move in his heart. And then I still have contact with this man and to watch the way he's matured and grown and understood. And today he says, there is never a doubt. There's never a doubt. I'm so convinced that I belong to him that nothing could ever tell me different. This is the Holy Spirit. Gifts down the road, the first thing he does is convince you who you belong to. You, and he glorifies Jesus and the work that he's done on the cross and says this is a finished work. You've received it. You never have to be afraid again, ever. This is a drop in the bucket of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but I believe this is his first. Is to con because what good are gifts for me if I'm not convinced of my salvation? That we, you have to get that settled first before you ever move on. And he and I, I'm convinced. Now I'm stepping out, and I'm, this is Jeff. What do you call Jacobology? This is Jeffology for a minute. Okay, I'm convinced that I don't think I don't think assurance of salvation is available outside of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I don't. I don't think. He, I don't think it is. I think because without him, we're left to try to make it a matter of a logical argument. And this, th you have to know here, not here. And that wonderful, wonderful Holy Spirit is the one who does it. God's Spirit bears witness to my spirit that I'm a son of God. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful ministry that he has. The book of James says that he lusts with envy to fulfill his office. What does that mean? He wants and desires, he's passionate to do that in your life. So here's what I don't get. I'm going to take on charismatic Pentecostalism religion for a minute, and which is where I come from, so I'm allowed. Um, we get this crazy weirdness going on about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, well, I've prayed and, and you're not doing this, you're not swaying or you're not falling or, or you're not dancing. or Look, I even saw this preacher on, on, on YouTube. He's kind of a well-known guy, really hurt. But he said, the Lord has anointed my right hand to heal people. Not my left, my right hand. And I'll only pray for you with my right hand, not my left. What nonsense is that? <laughs> That's nonsense. And it's abuse. I don't believe those things. Now, if Jesus said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, with your right hand, <laughs> I'm all behind it. But he didn't say those things. He said, no, this is who you are. It's your whole being. Right hand, left hand, right foot, left foot. It don't matter. We are people that demonstrate the kingdom with all our body parts, not just one of them. Right? That's what baptism in the Holy Spirit means. He permeates my whole being, not just an appendage. Nonsense. We get this craziness going on about praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is my, my mentor taught me a lot about this, um, Ron Hart Bonke. He has a daring belief about this that just really rubs Pentecostals the wrong way. But he has the fruit. We have faith to believe that all we have to do is confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts the Lord Jesus and we'll be saved, right? We have that faith that we receive salvation simply by faith. You being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father 
give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. But we've made it something by works sometimes that looks crazy and weird and turns people off. And let me tell you, you receive the Holy Spirit by faith just like you receive salvation. He's not going to withhold him. Look, Jesus said, I'm going to go away. The disciples start freaking out. What? You can't leave now. We got a kingdom to start. But he says, no, it's to your advantage that I leave. Because if I don't leave, the Holy Spirit won't come. Do you think for a moment he would withhold him for you if you ask? Now, I think we can ask because we're prompted to or coerced to and we really don't mean it in our heart. I'm not talking about that. But I've seen people come to the altar and ask for this. And the minister, well, you're not exhibiting the right signs. Seen it. That's nonsense. Don't tell me I need to exhibit a certain sign. My life will bear the fruit or it won't. Remember, I've said multiple times, I'm more concerned about the fruit of the Spirit than I am the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit allow me to produce the fruit. The gifts aren't the end, the fruit's the end. I want to bear the fruit. That's what I'm concerned with. My life will bear out if I've received Him or not. And it's not for you to decide at this time. I receive in faith whether I exhibit a sign. Listen, I love that stuff. I love them crazy, fiery people running around meetings. I sit in the corner and be like, this is cool. <laughs> but I, 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 I don't have to have that either. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this. I'm going to open up the altars. And if you dare, what was that we said in school? I double dog dare you. Because <laughs> you've been set up this morning. If it's the feeling in your heart that says, Lord, I want you to have all of me. I want, I want you to have all of me. Full access. My heart, my mind, my emotions. I, how many of us struggle with emotions? Lord, I want you to have all of me. Because he cares about that too. I want you to come up here. and It's not about me. I will not lay hands on you. Because it ain't about me. It's about him. Lord, I want you to have all of me. The good, the bad, the ugly, the real ugly, and the grotesque. I want you to have all of it. And I want your Holy Spirit in my life. It really is that simple. So, Miss George is going to play. Here it is. Now's your chance. Power, power.